Today, I'm at AACA Museum in Hershey, Pennsylvania, and I just want to give a huge thank you to them for making this video possible. Today, the featured car is a 1948 Tucker. But before we get started on the car, let's take a minute to talk about the man behind the vision, Mr. Preston Tucker. A bit of a background story of how this episode came to be. A couple months back, a viewer asked if I could review a 1948 Tucker. For those that don't know, a 48 Tucker was a huge deal because it was a brand new car. Advertisements said the newest car in 50 years or something to that effect. In my mind, while reading that comment, I was like, yeah, I'll get right on that. 52 cars made, depending on what source you read, 47 to 48 cars remaining, and they cost more than a million dollars. Jay Leno doesn't even have one, and that's saying something. Preston Tucker, born September 21st, 1903. He died December 26th, 1956. Preston loved cars at, the early, at an early age, and when Preston was 16, he started flipping cars. That means that he fixed them up and sold them for profit. Preston quit high school to pursue a job working as an office boy or a gopher for the Cadillac Motor Car Company. In 1922, he joined Lincoln Park Police Force because he liked driving fast and dangerous and riding in fast cars, and the police department was where he could do that legally outside the racetrack. Speaking of racetrack, in the early 1930s, Preston would go to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which was a pretty far trek for him because he lived in Michigan at the time. He would go there every month. He was very interested in race cars and their designers. Preston would meet Harry Miller, who was the go-to race car guy back in the day. Harry Miller had a carburetor shop as well as he built race engines. He inspired many automotive car companies such as like Duesenberg, Peugeot, Bugatti. Miller built his own three liter engine, which had four valves per cylinder and dual overhead cams. That engine actually inspired the Bugatti Type 51, which was the race car that replaced the Type 35 Bugatti. Harry Miller is gonna have his own episode one day. We're starting to go down a rabbit hole. Back on topic, Miller went bankrupt in 1933, like a lot of people did. It was the Great Depression. Preston and Miller built race cars together during that time period. In 1935, they formed a company together, Miller and Tucker Incorporated. In the late 30s, they developed the Tucker Combat Car. Tucker Combat Car, the Dutch government actually wanted a combat vehicle that could handle muddy terrain. Preston and Miller started building a prototype. Preston designed a narrow wheelbase armored combat car that was powered by a modified Packard V12 engine. It was nicknamed the Tucker Tiger, but sadly, Germans invaded the Netherlands in the spring of 1940 before Preston could finalize the deal and the Dutch government, they just lost interest in the project. Apparently one Tucker combat car was made. They tried to sell the idea and the design to the U.S. government, but the U.S. government declined and said that it was too fast. Think about that for a second. Evidently, it could go up to 100 miles per hour on a smooth surface and 65 miles per hour in terrain. Tucker developed a turret for the top of the combat vehicle it's a misconception that he invented the turret in general. It was a specially designed turret to go on the Tucker Combat Vehicle, as well as the Douglas B-18 Bolo, which was a different type of bomber. In 1940, Preston formed the Tucker Aviation Company with the goal of manufacturing aircraft and marine engines. This was a public corporation with stock certificates issued. Tucker raised enough capital to develop and design a fighter aircraft, the Tucker XP-57, which earned the interest of the United States Army Air Corps because we didn't have an Air Force at the time, developed a single prototype of an airplane. It was started, it was powered by a straight eight cylinder engine and it was developed by none other than Harry Miller. It was called the Miller L. 510. It was nicknamed the Peace Shooter. This fighter competed for World War II government contracts. However, financial problems ensued and essentially the U.S. government let the contract run out. After the war was over, I didn't live during that time period and there's a reason they are called the greatest generation. They gone without anything new. Everything was rationed. Every Gold was confiscated. It must have been very depressing for three plus years, maybe three or four years really. This generation, we can't go six months without a new iPhone. I mean, think about that. 
People wanted, they longed for something new, something different. The big three, they were shut down during this period of time. The government came and said, hey, you're not going to build any cars. You're going to build airplanes. You're going to build guns. You're going to build Jeeps. And they took away all the materials. Like there was no metal. There was no tin. There was no copper. They had steel pennies because there was a copper shortage. It was like that in America for three or four years. The big three, they had no intentions of making anything new. They just wanted to freshen up or do a facelift on their pre-war designs. And Preston saw this as an opportunity to get into the automotive game. Preston didn't have a car company or a car reputation for that matter. He could start from the ground up on what he thought or what he thought people would want in a car. Preston thought of safety, which no one thought about at that time. His car, the Tucker 48, was the first car to offer seatbelts, four-wheel independent suspension, all button switches and knobs located just to the left or in right behind the steering wheel so the driver did not have to reach across the car to push a button. A padded dashboard, Preston, to make his automotive dream a reality, leased the Dodge Aircraft plant, which was the largest building in the U.S. at the time. To give you an idea of how big this building was, it was 475 acres. It's huge. The facility was used to build the right R3350 Cyclone engines for the B-29 Super Fortress aircraft during World War II. The plant leasing agreement was contingent on raising $15 million by March of 1947. Preston signed the papers July 1946, so that's eight months to come up with $15 million. $15 million is a lot now. I tried to convert this into my calculator converter, and whenever I did, it just said, wow. Preston was able to make a prototype car nicknamed the Tin Goose. Drew Pearson coined that term in reference to uh, Howard Hughes's Spruce Goose. Preston would take the Tin Goose to shows like in New York City. They charged a mission to see it. Everywhere the Tin Goose went, it drew a crowd. And Preston Tucker became a household name practically overnight. Preston made 37 cars, which wasn't even a drop in the bucket for the amount of hype that this car had. Okay, let's talk about the Tucker 48. Preston Tucker had some really big ideas to make a safe, affordable, the newest car in 50 years. The original vision was to have disc brakes, fuel injection, seat belts, direct drive, meaning no transmission. Glass pops out when there's an incident and it's shatterproof. All button switches and knobs located by the driver, a crash chamber, padded dashboard, magnesium wheels. It had three headlights in the front. The center headlight, the lens, not the headlight itself, but the lens behind the headlight would turn with the steering wheel so you could see around corners better. Tucker wanted it to be powered by an engine that was totally different than anything else out there on offer. His idea, the original engine that was supposed to be powering the Tucker was a 589 cubic inch displacement, nine 0.65 liter flat six. It was the boxer style. Hemi combustion chamber with fuel injection, overhead valves. The engine didn't have a camshaft. The valves would open and close based on oil pressure and timing. It sounds like a complex engine now, let alone in the late 40s. The engine was designed to idle at 100 RPMs and cruise between 250 and 1200 RPMs. The 589 cubic inch engine uh, produced just about 200 horsepower, 450 foot pounds of torque at 1800 RPMs. When cruising at 60 miles an hour, the theoretical RPM would have been around 1000 RPMs, which is unheard of. So gas mileage would probably be really good in this car because the engine isn't stressing to move it down the road. The original design proposal with the 589 engine did not come with a transmission. Instead, the idea was to get the power to the wheels would be individual torque converters on each wheel and the power would go to the torque converters, the torque converters would turn the wheels. Not everything, not all of Tucker's ideas made it to the final product. Things that made it, they had a rear engine layout, Roll bar was integrated into the roof for rollover protection. 
steering box was located behind the front axle to protect the driver from frontal crash, padded dash, button switches and knobs were located in the driver's reach, parking brake had a lock with a key so one could lock the parking brake so the car wouldn't be stolen easily. Tucker kept innovating the Tucker design so no two cars are the same. Preston Tucker came to the realization that his 589 motor wasn't going to work. They just kept hitting setbacks and things weren't working out right. And it was really loud and it took 24 volts to crank it. And it was just a bunch of little issues that formed into a major problem. Tucker decided to buy the Franklin Motor Company because he loved the Franklin Motor design. The Franklin Motor was an air-cooled helicopter engine. Preston re-engineered it to be water cold and put it in the rear of the Tucker. Preston not only liked the Franklin engine, but he also bought the company to secure an engine for his up and coming car. Most of the Tuckers made used a cord transmission. Cord was a front engine, front wheel drive car. Tucker was a rear engine, rear wheel drive car. So they thought the cord transmission would work because it's essentially the same thing, it's just reversed. The cord transmission was very unique in the sense that it used solenoids to shift the gears. Tucker did go on and make his own automatic transmission, though super rare. There's only one car that it left the factory with, and it's actually the car that we're looking at today. There's a lot of different prototype engines that Tucker used. This is the Tucker engine prototype number seven. Manufacturer was Franklin. It was aluminum cast, 335 cubic inches, had 166 horsepower, 372 foot-pounds of torque, weighed 320 pounds. This engine was the last in the series of prototypes. Coming over here, this is a Tucker engine with the cord transmission and a Tucker radiator. Manufacturer was Franklin, cast aluminum, made 166 horsepower, 372 foot-pounds of torque, weighed 320 pounds. So just check out that. Moving over here, this is another Tucker, this is another Tucker prototype engine. It's made by Franklin, 335 cubic inches. 166 horsepower, 372 foot-pounds of torque. It seems like those are the numbers. This one over here is a Tucker Matic R12 automatic transmission with the Tucker engine. So the transmission right here. Evidently there was only four Tuckers that had the automatic transmission. And this was salvaged from one of the four destroyed cars. The, this same thing, it's uh, Franklin cast aluminum, 166 horsepower. It doesn't say how much torque, but it's probably the same. Over here, another Tucker prototype engine. Franklin manufactured it, air-cooled with Magneto. This is an early prototype Tucker engine. It was made by Franklin, cast aluminum, 335 cubic inches, 166 horsepower, 372 foot-pounds of torque. Okay, finally, let's talk about the 1948 Tucker. When I stood next to this car, it gave off such a presence. Like, I couldn't even imagine what it would be like in 1948 to see this car in person. I apologize, the lighting in here wasn't ideal. The brighter shots were taken with the cinematic camera. These were taken with the GoPro. I don't know why it looks all smudged and smeared. It didn't look like that the day that we took the video. But anyway, let's talk about some specs. Okay, the 48 Tucker rides a wheelbase of 128 inches. It is 219 inches long, 79 inches wide, 60 inches tall, 4,200 pounds is the weight. It is powered by the Franklin air-cooled Boxster six cylinder that's horizontally opposed. Overhead valves, it features overhead valves, 335 cubic inch displacement. The engine had seven to one compression, made 166 brake horsepower, 372 foot pounds of torque. 
and was paired with either the cord transmission or the Tuckermatic, which this is the only car that's ever been produced that left the factory with the Tuckermatic automatic transmission. All right, getting inside the 48 Tucker. Now, unfortunately, I don't know what all the button switches and knobs do, but I could tell you right there by the emergency brake, the chrome lever that's poking out at the bottom left-hand corner, there is a switch next to it that looks like a key lock. That was a feature that you could actually lock the emergency brake up or pull it out so that nobody can steal your car. The other key hole is to start the car. But a lot of those, it's just lost information, lost the time. This was the only car that left the factory with the automatic transmission. So these buttons will do different things than the ones in cars that had the cord transmission. Just look at how all the buttons are placed too. It almost looks like they're up on little miniature risers, like watching like a chorus concert or something like that, being up on little risers. It's very interesting design. Okay, moving on to the instrument panel. Notice it's a Uniscope style, much like a Nash or a Kaiser would have. The speedometer is in the center and then there's gauges that go along the perimeter of the speedometer. Starting at the top left in a clockwise motion, Oil pressure, amp, fuel, and temperature. Notice the placement of the radio. There isn't a dashboard in front of the passenger. That is a cave, and it is called the crash chamber. I guess the idea was one could dive inside the chamber and kiss their butt goodbye right before they crashed. Even though the driver does not have a dash, they still have a glove box, and we'll show you that location. It's a really cool place to keep stuff. Okay, so there is a glove box. It is located just on the, um, it's actually inside the passenger side door panel. And this opens up and there's a lot of room in there and it took everything within me to stick my camera in there and show you how much space there actually is. I apologize, it's a little darker than I wanted it to be. It was a totally genius idea to put the glove box inside of the door card, as well as they also put ashtrays inside the door cards as well excellent place to store stuff. I wanted to give you a visual of what the rear seat looks like and how much space you had back there. It's honestly one of the biggest, most spacious rear seats of any vehicle that I've ever seen that's not a limo. And I, I just wanted to show you what it looked like because the footage that I took is really dark. And, and I apologize for that again. Also notice there is no transmission tunnel because the engine and the transmission are in the rear, so the floor is completely flat. The trunk was actually located in the front of the vehicle, like a frunk. And just notice you could get two suitcases and a smaller suitcase inside of that area, as well as a spare tire. I think that the Tucker was the very first American car that was rear-wheel drive, rear-engined. In the comments section below, if there was anything that predated it, Volkswagen Beetle had a rear engine. Tatra, the Czechoslovakian car, was rear-engined, but both of those were air-cooled rear engines, and this one's liquid-cooled. It was supposed to be an air-cooled engine for a helicopter. I don't know why Preston Tucker saw the need to make it liquid-cooled when those other cars worked out air-cooled. Talk about some of the other things that were going on about the same time period. Preston Tucker had to come up with $15 million to keep the company, the plant, so he could build the cars that he wanted to build. He wanted to build 60,000 units a year, and that was the only plant that was big enough to accommodate that that didn't have anybody in it. So to do this, uh, Preston had to be an outside the box kind of thinker. Like he had investors, but the investors only had so much capital. He needed more capital. So he, he found different ways to come up with that capital. And one of the ways was to start selling accessories for his cars, like radios, seat covers, and people who bought the accessories were promised a spot on a waiting list when the cars became available for purchase. He also started selling dealership franchises. And this is where it started get he started getting in a lot of trouble because he had the tin goose. He he was building the cars at this point. The tin goose was the only thing that he had that was hard proof of a car. The SEC started looking at his company and him 
and his practices, and they thought that it was just a giant Ponzi scheme or a pyramid scheme, that there was no car, he was frauding people out of their money, telling people that dealership or whatever, a dealership franchise, and there was no dealership franchise. So that was their part of it. He was just having a hard time coming up with the money. The straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak, for the Tucker automobile was the media. And same goes true today. If they don't like you, they will do everything in their power to make a person, an organization, a corporation seem unfavorable. Drew Pearson was a popular journalist at the time. Same guy who joked and called the Tucker prototype Tin Goose said on his radio broadcast, like it probably doesn't even back up, just ran a negative program on the car. Next day, Tucker's stock was next to zero. Preston could never recover from the bad press. And you think that's bad enough? Oh wait, it gets worse. The SEC took control of everything. They seized all of Tucker's drawings, parts, prototypes, forced the factory to close, which laid off up to 1,600 workers without a job. And common sense would say, if you're paying 1,600 people to do something, it's probably not a Ponzi scheme. But there was a lot of lack of common sense in this whole thing. But there was a lot of things at play. And we're trying to simplify it. Like the big three had a part. The media had a part. The SEC had a part. But I'm just trying to keep everything condensed so that this video is not an hour long. The SEC also indicted Preston Tucker on 25 counts of mail fraud, five counts of violating SEC rules, and one single count of conspiracy to defraud. 300 loyal workers would go back to the factory, some without pay to finish assembling 13 more cars for a total of 51 cars with a prototype. A little bit of a side note, the 52 count comes from evidently they made a convertible prototype. Some say it exists, some say it doesn't exist. That's why I included it on here. Getting back to the lawsuit, the jury found him not guilty on all charges, but the damage was already done. Nobody would buy a car from him because of the bad publicity he got from the Drew Pearson broadcast. And there was a lot of rumors going around and swirling around. You know, when people talk, sometimes people start thinking that that's true. And people thought that of him. And that's what ultimately killed the Tucker was the media. And there was a lot of stuff at play. This is like an onion of a story. There's lots of layers. But despite losing just about everything, his dream of making the newest car in 50 years, Preston Tucker stayed positive. And that positivity continued, but lung cancer ended up taking him at the age of 53, December 26, 1956. I'm going to add one more side note. If you want to see more about Tucker, Preston Tucker's dream, there's a movie called Tucker, The Man and His Dream. It has uh, Jeff Bridges in it. It's an amazing movie. I actually kind of got a little bit emotional towards the end of it because it's very sad. I mean, the guy had ideas, ideas way ahead of their time. And, you know, he wasn't dealt a good hand, as you could see. Like, every single thing that he did got shot down. Okay, on to the pros and cons. An intriguing concept with an interesting history. Good appreciation potential. Outstanding performance. A milestone car against it. Forbiddenly expensive today. Parts are scarce. Very few left on the market. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you guys are ever out in Hershey, Pennsylvania, be sure to check out the AACA Museum. It also goes by the Bus Museum. They have a lot of antique vintage buses. They have a really good collection of cars outside of the Tucker collection. Best Tucker collection anywhere else. They got four... They either got three or four real cars as well as a movie car that was used in the movie. The red car off the side of, on the right hand side of the orange car, that car was used in the Tucker movie. It's totally fiberglass. But until next time, uh, toodaloo!